Innovators or cookie cutters? Do accelerators spur or limit growth? So that is the topic of our, uh, our debate, something that we're uh, really excited to do. Uh, of course, scholarly debate, respectful debate, um, sorry, not, not to tell you what to do, is, is part of uh, DRIVE, so we're going to have some fun, and I think we're going to hear from some really smart people. So speaking of which, I want to introduce um, our panelists, actually our, our debaters, they're not really panelists. Uh, starting uh, right here, uh, Menno van Dijk is the founder of Scale Up Nation, um, a lab practice fund supporting innovative enterprises that have developed beyond the startup phase, something we're all interested in here. Um, also a former McKinsey director working in strategy and growth and media, high tech and energy, and he led the McKinsey's, uh, he led McKinsey's European media practice for seven years. Um, as per the practice, I'm not going to read his whole bio yeah. uh, because it's going to take too much time. Um, Johan Wickland is a, a visiting, uh, Las Rita's visiting chair, so he's is actually here in the building for a period of time and visiting us from the University of Syracuse. Um, he's considered a leading authority in entrepreneurship research with over, over 50 articles appearing in leading entrepreneurship and management journals and over 20,000 citations. I believe he'll be drawing upon those 20,000 citations today during the debate. And Charles Plant um, leads a multi-year research project to, to determine why Canada is challenged at turning its many technology startups into world-class companies. He also teaches the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, University of Toronto, the Institute for Management and Innovation, and the School of Continuing Studies. Without further ado, I hand it over to you, Charles. Perfect. You know, this is a, a fascinating subject to me because I've been in and out as an entrepreneur, as a venture capitalist, and working with a number of these incubators and accelerators. And to put it into context, University of Toronto has 10 incubators just within the university. The city has over 60 incubators, the city of Toronto. And John Marshall, are you still here? John Marshall spends over $100 million a year supporting the incubators and accelerators. So we really have to ask the question, are we doing any good? And I'm, I'm going to let each of these two lovely individuals uh, introduce a bit about themselves to make it a little more personal. Uh, Menno really wanted to do this because he's shy. So. <laughs> so. Um, my background, in, um, um, I come from uh, Northern Netherlands, Friesland, and um, almost all of my relatives um, moved to Canada in the 50s, 60s. That's what was called entrepreneurship in those years. And um, my oldest uncle, uh, Jeffrey, walked off the boat and needed to the nearest farm. And they thought he was a mute because he didn't speak a single word of English. Um, my, when it was my dad's turn to, uh, to go, he, um, his mom died and he, uh, he went south because uh, we had our own Silicon Valley then in the early 60s, which was uh, Philips. And uh, he, uh, he started there and he became an inventor. Cool as it gets, he still has a life patent on the CD player. And, um, and that was like uh, economic uh, growth and a boom around technology created employment for about half a million people and people coming from all around the world. And then um, I uh, studied physics and mathematics to join Philips and then um, um, uh, had a turn down and um, joined McKinsey. And so with the idea to go and work for uh, Philips and then I did so eventually and then later on in, uh, in life um, started getting more and more interested in actually uh, scaling some smaller companies, in particular those that also make the world a bit better. And because um, this comes from my, uh, my, my own daughter. And, um, and I'm a very, uh, in a way, traditional, like in particular when you come from McKinsey, it's a story of you get best possible education, then you make a lot of money, and at a certain moment when you're in your late 50s, you think, was it that all for? And you start to give back. And um, my own daughter, who's a gifted entrepreneur said, um, what the millennials will ask, will tell the world, is to bring those three things together. And so you earn and you learn and you return at the same time. And uh, that's what I want to do at uh, Scale Up Nation. Perfect. And Johan, you had a bromance going this morning with uh, Richard Florida, both being <laughs> propeller heads. So, do you have any? So, yeah, so, so I typically get two questions. Um, the first one is, how tall are you? 
And I'm, I'm two meters flat, six foot seven. The second question is when, when people hear my accent, they ask, where are you from? And I always say I'm from Syracuse, New York, and they look at me, really? Uh, I was born and raised in Sweden, therefore the accent. The rest of my family, they got rid of theirs when they moved to the US. I kept mine for whatever reason. Uh, so my background, very briefly, I come from a family business background. We had a business in my family for over 100 years, and I was uh, the black sheep of the family because I didn't take over the business. So it was sold instead. I'm trying to make up for it by studying entrepreneurs and small business. Uh, I've been doing that for the last uh, over 20, I started in 95 with my PhD. I've been doing it for over 20 years. Uh, I love it. I think it's being an academic is the most fantastic things uh, thing you can do. Uh, I'm particularly interested in people that are somewhat different uh, entrepreneurs that have uh, often mental disorders such as uh, ADHD, for example. I'm, I like people that are slightly different. Uh, go against the grain. Uh, hopefully we can be talk a little bit about this dur during the conversation today. <laughs> if I remember. Um, let's start with a bit of a poll. I mean, we've got a controversial topic here. Are you, do, do incubators do more harm than they do good? So I want to start, before we have eloquent arguments from these two, who here thinks that um, incubators do more good than harm? And who here thinks that incubators might actually do more harm than good? Okay, that's fascinating. I didn't think, now none of you are, of course, is employed in an incubator, so they do a lot of good for the people who are employed there and, and give lots of fodder for people's research. So, so let's start off with Johan, who has done some fascinating research. I was trying to read some of his old research, but I refused to pay $25 because then his readership count would go up and right now I understand his readership count is lower than his citation count. I didn't <laughs> want to influence that. So if you could tell us about your most recent um, research, it'd be great. Okay, so um, uh, we noted a few years ago that there's a lot of research on incubators, accelerators. I'm going to use those terms pretty interchangeably. I'm, in my mind, an accelerator, it's a matter of time, how long you stay in, in these facilities. If it's short, it's an accelerator. If it's longer, it's an incubator. Anyway, uh, we noticed that there was a lot of research, but very little systematic research about the businesses and the outcomes of, of this incubation. So we did a study where we looked at all incubated firms in the US for a decade, and we had a match sample of similar firms that were not, not incubated. And what we found was actually that the businesses that were incubated performed worse than the ones that were not incubated. Not very, uh, not very uh, good results in a way. So then we, we have re replicated our research. We looked at all university spin-offs in Norway over a period of 15 years, and we found the same things. The spin-offs that went through the incubators performed worse than the ones that didn't. And then we, um, uh, other people have replicated this in Italy. So then, of course, the question we ask is, is why is this? That doesn't make sense, does it? If you spend all this money, it, it, we should see that they actually do better. And I mean, the way we think about this is that people, firms, entrepreneurs be might become too comfortable in the incubator. So at the end of the day, you need to be competitive in the market, right? You need to do something that customers want to pay for. You've got to beat your competition to it. And the best way to learn that is to actually be in the market. But in order to qualify to get into one of these programs, because they're competitive, right? You have to meet certain criteria. And those criteria for getting into the incubator are not necessarily the same as being successful in the market. And it actually is pretty difficult for a new venture to pivot. So if they start by being organized in one way in an incubator, once they get thrown out, it's hard for them to adapt to that new life in the tough market environment. So what we did then was that we did one more thing, and that is we went back and looked at how about firms that are started outside of an incubator and then move in, how do they perform? And it turned out that they actually perform better than both the ones that were never in an incubator and those that were started in an incubator. So that means that they were set up, got a foothold in the market, 
were able to start generating cells, etc., got their set up in, in, in the appropriate way, and then they were able to make use of the resources from their incubators and accelerators. So that's like the short, uh, short story about so, this research. So that, that's a good short story, and actually you, you explained that very well. So and, and anybody can get that, but Meno, you're, you're spending your life incubating companies. Um, you know, hearing results like that, how do you feel? So yeah, I, I, and, um, I look at success uh, very differently. I think and, um, when, when I look at the scale-ups I support, there are typically um, folks uh, led by uh, teams that are in their late 30s, early 40s. And um, so, at least in Europe, I don't see um, university graduates go straight into building a scale-up. So I look at an, uh, an incubator, like the typical university incubators around the world, as being an extended education. And it's a little bit like, you know, we have a hotel here and, and next to um, Center of Waterloo, there's a little skating ring. And so, yeah, like the Dutch, we're big skaters. We all start, you know, when we're five or six on the skating ring. And then uh, once you become a reasonable skater, you go on the canals. And uh, it's just a different game. And so I wouldn't sort of measure performance on the skating ring. And I would just think like, uh, great for kids to, to get that extended education for one or two years and uh, learn some stuff. Both of my uh, children became entrepreneurs before graduating. My dad had to cry. And, um, and I also actually, because I thought, why not just uh, be in a little bit of a safe ground a little bit longer. And then when you're in your 30s, 40s, you build something serious. So are you, are you looking specifically at incubators that are taking students out of university into them, or are you looking at incubators for 40-year-olds as well? So the study in the US was all incubated firms in the country, so it depends. I mean, there are all those um, uh, that take on, you know, some take on students, some take on uh, people much later in life. So whatever those incubators do, they were in our study. Uh, in the Norwegian data, we actually looked at university spin-offs, often started by, I mean, started by researchers, not, actually not started by students, we excluded those. So you both touched on this issue of success. Yeah. What's your definition? Because you're saying, well, it's more successful if they do this, so what's success mean? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> as a researcher, you have to look at something, so we, we looked at and we looked at survival of the businesses. We also looked at growth of the businesses. But um, I think it's important to think, and I think this is a source of conflict to some extent, that success for the business, businesses in the incubator and success of the incubator are not the same, right? If you're an entrepreneur, I guess you want your business to survive, you want it to, to flourish. I think incubators are potentially more interested in having one or two unicorns you know, have one or two that really succeed and doesn't really matter what happened with those the other ones. A little bit like venture capitalists look at their portfolios. So there's a bit of a conflict there. But in my research, we've looked at uh, growth and survival of businesses. Okay, and so what's, Mano, what's your definition? Because Netherlands has no, has, have no unicorns. No, absolutely zero. So, <laughs> totally unsuccessful country. Yeah, clearly. And, um, yeah, so I come here to learn. Yeah. And, um, don't, don't try and learn in Canada, we've got one. Now, like, at a certain moment, and, um, I was lucky because and, um, Deloitte walked in the door and they had built a database of half a million startups around the world. It was a merger and acquisition database for corporates to buy small companies. And they said, are you interested in analyzing it? So put a little team together. And two things came out of it. One is that um, half of startups fail. And that takes about seven years. And the interesting thing I found in it was because with half a million startups, global database, you can do all kinds of cuts. It doesn't matter whether you're an ultra conservative Geneva or trigger happy Silicon Valley. It doesn't matter what industry you're even in. It seems like the law of physics. And the seven years I always use to say in my own company, like we're still in year five, Let's be a little bit uh, frugal here. The other thing is that less than, an, less than a percent actually become sizable companies. And it reminded me to uh, something uh, also in, our, uh, in my country. About 20 years ago, I set up a business plan competition. 
And after 10 years, we did an audit on it. And all of the companies that had gone through it, uh, to the, together, if you would sum them up in terms of revenues, it amounted to 1.5 billion euros, which is quite sizable. But that is a thousand companies, so 1.5 million per company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, euros again, so about 3 million US, uh, Canadian dollar. And half of the 1.5 billion were two companies. So two out of a thousand created half of the new un employment. Mm -hmm. And this was at the time when in our country, I think, I guess, like many countries, we started to talk about uh, we need to become a startup nation. And um, I was thinking, uh, it's wrong, it's bullshit. I think we don't need more startups. And um, we um, have always been a country of multinationals, major employers. And um, let's create more of those. Okay, so your, your measurement is creating multinational, large-scale employers. New so employment. The unicorn, unicorn type philosophy. Yeah, but uh, not from a valuation point of view. It, the, the, it, we might be getting an issue of perspectives here because, Johan, you, have you ever worked in an incubator or? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I'm an engineer by training. My first job was to be like a liaison between a, um, one of these, uh, it was called a science park back then because we're talking about the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, and uh, between those companies there and uh, the um, other businesses, so to say. And then I also, I also started a, a business actually with some students. Uh, we were, they located in, in one of those incubators. It failed miserably. So I'm, I, I still need to work. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but I've had some experience. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me switch sides here for a second. I, I want to find out from you then, what, what are incubators doing right? I'm not going to find out from Meno what they're doing wrong. And just a, a self-critical analysis. Yeah. Um, should I start? Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's clear if you interview, if you talk to people who are in incubators, which a lot of research has done, you know, they focus on what, what, how, what do they think when they're there. Uh, a lot of them actually value the, the experience. And I think a lot of people talk about the fact that you get to meet other people that are in a similar situation and you learn from other entrepreneurs. And another thing that they, they talk about is, is these networking opportunities to people with funding and, and so forth and other you know, potential customers and so on. So I, I would think that um, those would be the, uh, the largest benefits. Okay, we'll get back to that later because you've raised an interesting point there. So, you know. What are they doing wrong? Yeah, what are, what are incubators doing wrong? What, perhaps what could they be doing better? Well, there's a couple of things they, um I think they do wrong if, we, if we're talking about increasing uh, success rates. I think the first one is um, um, the whole uh, idea of uh, designing all of these uh, incubators to look like American student dorms. It's, um, that's not at all how in my company, uh, in my country, uh, large enterprises have be, ever been built. And it's being exported and you can see them from, uh, from, from, from a distance. You know, wooden tables, uh, ping pong table, um, uh, everyone with a t-shirt, and uh, funny posters on the wall, and a lot of lean startup thinking. And it's, an, um, it is, it's, 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 it's more like a media concept than anything else. I think an, um, another thing is this whole idea of uh, collaboration and co-creation. And um, I looked at that in, in the previous life in detail. I think even in organizations, larger organizations, almost impossible to have folks work together that are in different offices on the same floor. So forget about those uh, little startups collaborating. I think the whole idea is that you're just in one building so they feel like they're home because it's a culture that they like to fit into. And I think finally it's like an, um, you know, like as a Dutchman I'm quite proud of uh, TV formats like Voice Off. And uh, in a way, an incubator is like that. It's a straight jacket media format. It's an intent format where everyone is fed through exactly the same structure. But we all know that true entrepreneurship is completely individualistic, completely path dependent, and it's really dependent on serendipity, on luck, on opportunism. And so that doesn't fit in a half year program where you've got your steps and your final step is to do a pitch day. So and this gets back to your point about People, what they value is the sense of community and the connections and things like that. And 
far be it from the three of us, uh, three old, tall, white men to bring up the issue of diversity, but some of your research bears on this issue of diversity and lack of diversity, and you want to go for, go for that? Thank you. Yeah, that's, this is like one of my, my favorite topics because uh, I, I approach it from two, two view, uh, viewpoints. So I completely agree with this statement about that they all incubators, accelerators look essentially the same. I visited them in, uh, on four different continents and it, it's amazing. So, I mean, the kind of programs provided, you know, the, the Lean Startup model, the, the Business Model Canvas, the 24-hour hackathon, Startup Weekend, go, so on and so forth. Very similar programs. And uh, very similar people that actually are, get into these spaces. Very often, uh, white or Asian men aged 25 to 40 that are very socially uh, competent, often skinny, tall and drink coffee and ride bicycles. Uh, so that's, that's like, and you see them all over the world and I find that uh, remarkable. We know that if you want to have an ecosystem that is sustainable, it should not be monoculture. We need to have diversity. That's how ecosystems survive if they're an external shock. And I don't think we're doing a very good job. So I, I think that's a problem, if I can continue a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and um, um, I also think, there's this problem that a lot of entrepreneurs that are successful, and we know this, are people that are somewhat quirky, people that are different. I mean, I know that um, Peter Thiel, he talks about uh, a lot of entrepreneurs he meet, they uh, probably have Asperger's syndrome. And I know that uh, Melissa Schilling wrote a book called Quirky about Elon Musk and other people. And I think that those people don't fit in this mold and this model. They typically don't get selected to get into these environments. And I think they can do great things, and I think it's, it's a shame that we're excluding these. So I think that's really important that we, we kind of look beyond the standard concepts of who gets in, in addition to not only having, like you said, white men, but I also think it's people that think yeah. different ways that don't fit in the standard mold. So you know, Jim Balsilli recently called it the incubator accelerator industrial complex in a speech. How do you break away from that to give people the individual attention that they need and, and not f get on this path? Yeah, so if I may, to also react on uh, what you're saying, I look at that very differently. I think um, what my daughter explains to me, and I see that also constantly, is that um, it's not that these uh, power women and these minorities are not invited into these incubators, but as my daughter says, they just don't need it. It's more like um, for, um, it's the same like, you know, you typically see the boys stay home longer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're ready for the real world, go for the real world. If you find it difficult to leave university, you stay in an incubator for another one year. So I don't think uh, the incubator should be more inclusive, but it should just realize that uh, the real talent is already rocking. And um, there's a risk of it being a too much of an enclosed little uh, excited incubator that wants to invite people from the outside that don't need it. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, point well taken. I think the important consideration is that we're actually in countries such as Canada, countries such as the Netherlands, countries such as Sweden, we are spending a lot of taxpayers' money on these uh, institutions, right? Both directly by subsidizing them and setting them up, building them, and also indirectly through the universities. So I think that it's really important that these things do what they're supposed to. I mean, that we get a, a lot of bang for the bucks. You know, the fact that you say they can be a, a what do you do call it, a dorm room or whatever. I don't think that's good enough. I think that we need, uh, we need to show that they're able to, to provide value. And in that regard, I think it's, it's worth thinking about when we use these taxpayers' money, should we really be spending them on the people that are probably the best suited to get regular jobs, that are, can be successful in any career, but in order for them to start their own businesses? I'm going to give an example. I'm sure that a lot of the people in the incubators here in Waterloo are very well suited to start working for, let's say, the Google or Microsoft that are here. So why not just let those guys work there and we don't need to spend uh, all this money on incubators for them? So, you know, 
you do some research on the work you're doing, how can you prove the net economic benefit? Because if you're dealing with a, an already privileged set of people, uh, is there proof of a net economic benefit to incubators that uh, you, know, you can get behind? Yeah, I, I'm, um, in that way, I'm not doing any research. Yeah, so an, um, I'm an, um, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm not focused on those uh, university graduate startups. Yeah, I focus on a different group of people that are uh, serial entrepreneurs that have done a couple of startups, are ready for something big. What um, um, I realized that um, what might work in uh, consulting definitely doesn't work in, um, in supporting those folks, and that's giving advice. So um, what I try to do is provide them with tools, and uh, for those tools I, I need to do a little bit of research, if you might call it, and that is to understand what actually makes a difference. And um, so I try to uh, understand the difference between a scale-up and one that stalls. And um, I'm not that interested in the early days of startups because when, uh, when I get interested in them, they're already beyond that phase. And in analyzing that, and, um, um, I, um, I did also, um, um, because I did attract some funding, and some of that also came from um, um, non-profit. And they also uh, pushed me to then uh, try to create alliances with academia and do this properly, but that didn't really work. So um, I end up uh, doing the research, if you may use that word mostly, but just staying very, very close to, um, to the scale of I support, develop tools with them, and what works we do more of. Okay, so you've differentiated between startup and scale up, and concentrating yeah. on scale up. It, it, do we have a situation here, perhaps, where it works better for scale ups than startups? Uh, yeah, I mean, what I said was before that if they're started in, outside of the incubators and move in, they perform really well. So I, absolutely, I think it's much better to support <clears throat> businesses later in their lives, to use an analogy. Uh, I think it's, if you want to support them, it's not so much about getting uh, infants to learn to walk, it's more about getting toddlers to learn to run. Does it make okay. sense? Yeah. So it, it's those later stages. You might call them growth. You might, you know, talk about scale up. But those later stages make more sense. Absolutely. So then, what you're saying is, really, we're wasting our money to go through business model canvas and lean startup and and those type of framework type things that are essential at the very first stage. Or, well, I, I'm wasting our money. I think it's it's important. I think it's important to evaluate if that's the case. That's number one. Number two is I think that we need diversity in terms of these different spaces, these different programs. You said we're the 60 in, in Toronto alone. I'm sure that they all focus on different kinds of industries, mm -hmm. but I would expect that a lot of those 60 incubators will select the same kind of people. They will run the same kind of programs. I mean, if we have 60 incubators, I think we can have a lot of diversity in terms of what kinds of folks do you want to invite, what kind of programs are you going to put them through, etc. So that's I think is really, really important, yeah, and most, then see what works. Yeah, most of them are startups. So if you're not providing mentorships to the scale-ups, because you know advice isn't particular, and frankly, it's difficult, I would imagine, to get people who've gone through it to give the advice, and it might be not applicable, what, what sort of programs work with scale-up? Yeah, so I wanted to build on that analogy of, um, of uh, toddlers and small children. I think it's more the comparison between the toddlers and teenagers. And so, um, um, advising teenagers, we all know, is ridiculous. Also, mentoring them is actually bullshit. And so, it's more about providing opportunity, investing in them, having a lot of patience and coaching. And I think for most people, it's so difficult that then they say, uh, let's just create more babies. Yeah, and it's, it's more fun and easier. It's quite fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just got distracted there by creating babies. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the things that you can offer, though, to a scale-up are very unstructured, independent. You offer cash. You actually invest. Yeah. Aren't you? In what percentage of the scale-ups do you, do you invest? Um, so we try to deal risk. So, and, um, um, first of all, we, uh, we try to get 
a little bit of clarity on uh, what are good selection criteria. And here, at least in, in my country, most VCs are at a scale where they can't do their own um, research, typically outfits of about 10 people. We don't have a VC in our country that is of the size of a Kleiner Perkins. And so um, start with doing own research on success factors and predictors. So we've got about 20 of those. Based on that, we select from about 2,000 startups, scale-ups, which ones we find interesting. We bring in about uh, 15 every half year. Those, um, we have an, uh, a first get to know each other thing of about half a year. Then the ones we get most excited about, we start supporting for at least uh, a full year. And then after that year, we tend to invest in about um, at least half of them. And it's typically then Series B. So in a way, it's a quite a de-risk process where you start working together, you build trust, you're having added value, you basically step in at the moment that most Dutch VCs are starting to get at the end of their fund size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like the typical Dutch VC is about 30 to 50 million. We have about 150. And so we can take a co-financing, we can take a second round. Okay, so that's a substantially different model than exists in, in Canada that I'm aware of, that taking late stage companies and putting them in. Did any of your research cover that particular circumstance? Nope. Okay. <laughs> so, so we have a, a, a real differentiation. What about the other places in Netherlands? I presume there are a lot of startup incubators. Yeah. Are you seeing some of the same results? That yeah, well, you see two things. I think uh, you've got commercial incubators, like uh, Startup Bootcamp and Rockstart, and you see uh, the, inc uh, the university-related incubators. University-related re uh, incubators are an extension of a university, so you've got uh, staff which is academic, and uh, they're trying to be helpful, and uh, budgets are very, uh, very slim, and therefore uh, the quality is what you can expect for the budget. And then you've got the uh, commercial incubators, who are, um, I think, um, I, what I see is most of them starting to drift towards more and more of um, a corporate incubation, which I think will not go anywhere, but is, from a commercial point of view, very attractive, very high fees. What do you mean by corporate incubation? Mm -hmm. So, uh, setting up a corporate incubator, and in particular in companies that don't have any incubation legacy, like a bank or a telco, and then uh, create let's, a portfolio of small stuff and supporting that. Okay. That's becoming a big business around the world. Okay. So in, in looking at the startups, is there something startup incubators could do better? Is there anything that you found? And are there some that are performing well? And have you differentiated between the performers and non-performers? Um, really difficult question. I mean. Uh, there's been, people have done that kind of research. I, I can't, right off the bat, I can't think of, of what that would be. Um, but I think the important thing is that, is like a, a, is that we, we think about, we don't need to use Silicon Valley as a model for everything, like somebody said before, that we, we think about that we can, different incubators can be different, good at different things. Uh, just came to mind here, I know, for example, somebody that started a decent, Accelerator rather than accelerator okay. in, in Melbourne. I was there uh, last year, and so when he talks about success, it's very much different from when. Uh, so what's a decelerator, first of all? Uh, it's essentially uh, so his own background is he, he was an entrepreneur and uh, uh, burned out. Essentially, he was just full on, and so he moved back to Australia and just realized. Uh, as I've also seen a lot of entrepreneurs are struggling with their mental health and their well-being, and realized a lar large reason is because they try to do everything too fast. It is this kind of program that, you know, you get your venture capital as soon as you can, and you want to, want to scale up as fast as you can. And with your background, you know that's very hard. It, it takes a big toll on you as an individual, right? So you just realize that that's, uh, there's a lot of people who don't fit that mold. So instead, let's do things slowly and let's look, take care of ourselves in the process. And yeah, that's essentially the kind of programs he offers. So he's still trying to grow it's more companies, like, but at a, you know, it's more that the, the, yeah, the companies, yeah, it's companies that are more interested in, in, in trying a different model are welcome to come there and, and that's how he gets his funding. So he, he doesn't take equity in the, in the businesses.
Okay, so, so in, in actual fact, you're both in agreement, and we're not having much of a debate here, which is quite frustrating. <laughs> uh, we needed Ian Klugman up here <laughs> to, to defend his, uh, his 17 incubators. The, um, if you were in government, and you could raise a mag wave a magic wand, if you got to be John Marshall for a day, what would you do um, with regard to all of these incubators and yeah, I think popping up? Like, in, um, sounds like a uh, cop-out, but I mean it quite seriously, and I'm also working hard on it. I would say really stay out of it. I think, and um, also linking back to the uh, present or the speech early in the morning of Richard Floyd about seeing cities as an organizational unit. Like, uh, I believe uh, systems, uh, cities are these, these complex um, systems. They're not organizational units. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you've got the municipality at the table or higher level government. And um, it, um, it does m much more harm than it does good. And I think the, yeah, the opportunity is not organizing it that much. Uh, maybe with the exception of major infrastructure. For and buildings? Sorry? Uh, buildings with Not so much buildings, but like, uh, tables? like for example, and, um, um, my city Amsterdam is quite big around um, all kinds of internet related services. That is because um, from a physical point of view, we are a global hub. And so a couple of billions were spent in that, in, into that physical uh, infrastructure. And uh, stuff like that also, uh, like we, we as, as a country are, I think, famous for food and agri. So we've got in the center of the city, a uh, country, we've got Wageningen, which is the largest uh, private uh, research institute in food and agri in the entire world. So it attracts the Monsantos, it attracts all the big companies. And it has serious depth. And making those kind of investments, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, yeah, that does pay off, and that the market itself cannot provide. Okay. Uh, You've been itching just to get yeah. your magic wand. You, you notice that? Yeah. <coughs> uh, no, the, uh, I think, it's a, I think the, the first thing would be to do seri serious evaluations of what works and what doesn't. I mean, I think to a large extent these institutions, these uh, programs are kind of walking around in the dark, not knowing what actually works. I think it's when we're spending government money, we should really evaluate this in a serious manner. And having, you know, tenants of these facilities fill out happy sheets, it's not sufficient. You know, if they like it or not, it's not sufficient. We need to be serious and see what are the implications of this and so forth. Because, uh, yeah, that's my primary recommendation to your policymaking friends. Okay. <laughs> and, and um, you know, it, Beyond that, if you were looking at an entrepreneur and advising an entrepreneur, what would you say to the entrepreneur? Um, I would say go to the market as soon as you can. The best thing of learning what works is, is to try, the first thing you want to do is try to sell something. Doesn't matter if you, if you even have a product. See what the market really wants. And it's only one way of finding out, and that's actually being in the market. That's the advice I always give. Yeah. So again, I like advice has very limited value, but what I would indeed advise against it is um, getting preoccupied with pitch nights, uh, nights and raising capital. It's really like uh, the coolest thing is to be completely bootstrapped. And uh, that's the real pride. And that's really smart. And um, yeah, and I think uh, we should have the awards for uh, those that raise the least capital and, uh, and that way uh, grow and survive. Okay. Definitely go for that. Have you got any last points? I'm going to turn it open to the audience and so you can get attacked for a second. Um, but do you have any last points before we do that? I think, and um, I don't want to be too negative about all the incubators for a different reason. And that is, um, to me, it's a little bit like uh, soccer. In, uh, in my country, uh, we're big on soccer. Every, every little kid, when they turn six, want to play in a team. Uh, and uh, I also, I played for uh, maybe like 15 years, and so did my son, and both of us, we always dreamt of becoming a Barcelona player. Obviously, not anything we learned helped us towards that, and we obviously didn't have the talent. Yeah? But still, as a result, it's in our culture that we all love soccer. Mm. Yeah? And uh, so I think even if out of incubators, nothing materializes, if it helps the whole society, 
feel a pride and a longing and an, and an, uh, uh, about the whole act of innovative entrepreneurship and that being cool and a dream, even if those that in the end uh, build something large never walk that way, doesn't matter. Yeah. So, so to you, it's culture and community building. Yeah, I think that's very valuable. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> I think the beauty of entrepreneurship is largely that it's, it's a vehicle for people to kind of realize their full potential. I think that's what fascinates me about entrepreneurship and making a difference in the world. And I think that people get into entrepreneurship for all sorts of individual reasons, all sorts of different reasons. And I think that it's important that whatever infrastructure we have to support that doesn't assume that people have these goals of building the next uh, unicorn or whatever, but we really uh, embrace the fact that people are in this for different reasons and uh, uh, support them in what they're trying to accomplish. Thanks. Let's uh, open it up to the audience here. Hi, my name is Devender. I'm from Montreal. And at least in Quebec, we have a lot of public money going into accelerators and incubators. But at the same time, we have a severe shortage of people, of workers that can be hired to uh, help these companies progress. What have you seen in your studies and observations about the role of accelerators and incubators to not only build businesses, but also to expand the pool of people who could be hired by these companies as they grow? So we saw, we saw in, in a, our Norwegian study that uh, when the government put a lot of money into supporting these businesses, a lot of businesses were, were started. When they pulled the plug after about 15 years, a lot of business, uh, new businesses went, went down and a lot of businesses folded. But that actually was when a lot of other businesses took off because we think it kind of freed up a lot of competence. So the ones that really had the potential were able to hire those people that had been locked up in these other small businesses. So it might be that it's like a secondary effect. So that the, a lot of businesses were started, but these businesses then went to the ones that really had some potential. Can I add to that? Oh yeah, please do. Yeah, what, um, what we see is that um, um, the later stage entrepreneurs, they take um, serious risks and therefore um, they, uh, they tend to surround themselves with people with whom they have a background. You know, people come from the family or, uh, you know, they were with them in the army or whatever. And, and um, sometimes it's, they're excellent recruiters because they tell a great founder story, but they recruit based on quite uh, serious ma management biases. So helping them professionalize their selection is key here, not their ability to attract. And, uh, yeah. Is on? Okay. Um, thank you so much, that was a great um, discussion, debate. My question is about, um, Recently we're seeing a lot of programs and incubators focused on females, so female only incubators, female only programs. Um, some argue that you know, this, is, this ghettoizes female entrepreneurs, others say that you know, given a lot of the bro culture in these incubators that this is what's needed. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on yeah, these types I of programs. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have a fact on that that uh, should make you really angry. So, uh, yeah, I, um, and I mean it quite serious. A very good friend of mine runs a very large corporate incubator um, in New York focused on um, women-led teams. And I said, um, I asked her, she's been running that for about 10 years now, what are the statistics? Are they worse? Are they better? She said, um, exactly the same performance, but they give away more equity for the same valuation. So you're basically being underpriced. Yeah, and um, so I just say uh, go there and uh, launch those businesses and uh, fight for your worth and don't dilute too much because you think you're a minority. Go for it. Uh, I thought it was very interesting to listen to Maria Gotch this morning when she said that in New York City, which is one of the most diverse cities in the world, they have a problem with the lack of diversity in the tech sector. Uh, it's, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, I think that, I mean, 
I think diversity involves so much more than race and gender. And I think there's all these things about that we're differently wired. But I do believe that uh, any kind of diversity is good. So I believe it's a good thing if we can get these places to be more diverse. I think that's a good thing. The, the wands going around. Yeah, hi. Um, forgetting about unicorns for a second or you know, large valuation companies, but rather focusing on those multinationals. <clears throat> Both Sweden and the Netherlands have a lot for the population. Sweden's maybe a quarter of the size of Canada, Netherlands maybe half, but I can think of Ikea, Philips, Spotify. What's the secret? Yeah. You want to go for Sweden? Well, I, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, what, uh, I think it's, Sweden has always been involved, like the Netherlands, in international trade, has always been outward looking, always focused on learning foreign languages, I think it's, I mean, and if you're going to expand in a small country such as Sweden, you know, need to go international very, very early. And that's if you take IKEA, if you take Spotify, even older companies like Ericsson, uh, they went international very, very early in their development. So I think that's been the small size of the country and that the international orientation, I think, has been, been critically important. Yeah, I think it's uh, indeed it's the benefit of a small country and, and the benefit of being a country with, uh, where all the major cities are harbor ports. And so the orientation of the such nations is uh, very trade oriented, very mercantile, very internationally oriented. There's a huge comfort with diversity flowing in through the ports. You constantly see the kind of people that you're talking about. and um, and. Yeah, like for the Netherlands, it goes all the way back to the 17th century. The Netherlands uh, was the first one to create an incorporated international the VOC that expanded all the way from New Amsterdam, now New York, to uh, Jakarta and a, and a trading post in Japan. And it's always been like that. The whole idea was that every company as quickly as possible would become an international trading company. So companies like uh, Philips, Unilever, Shell, etc., etc., etc. As a uh, former McKinsey partner, uh, when you're a senior partner, you get severely penalized by serving small uh, enterprise. It's typically at around the one billion revenues. But then in the Netherlands, it's rich picking. Yeah, there's at least a hundred of those. So I think we've got one last question. Thank you. Just a, a quick comment and then a question perhaps. Um, one of the things I do, I'm the research director at the Lazaridis Institute and I struggle hard to uh, get data to try to understand what uh, causes and drives growth in technology firms. And we too are particularly interested in firms that are not startups, they are stay-ups that are trying to scale. And, and this is one of the reasons we have Scale Up Nation here, Menno, is because we have a similar mindset. We're not interested in the young firms, the new firms, and certainly not the firms coming right out of university. Um, one of the things we have learned through the research is that it's not until a firm has traction, has customers, have reven has revenue as in international markets, that they actually see the value of an accelerator or an incubator. Until that point in time, they're not in a position to leverage that knowledge, and Johan, that's very consistent with your results. Um, but one of the things I see in Canada, and I, Ian, are you here still? I have a suspicion he left. He, uh, he didn't want to hear this. Um, so at Communitech, as an example, they're a partner of ours, but they're a competitor of ours in the sense that the government has forced them into a situation where they are funded by the government, in part, large, largely in part, and as a result, they are doing everything they can to develop new program offerings. And so they have many. And those program offerings are perhaps unique in this region, but they are cookie cutter copies all over the country. And what we end up with is the same thing in green happening all the way across the country, which means there's a lack of differentiation, which means they're all competing for government money yet offering the same thing. And I'm wondering if you see that memo in Holland and if you, if you don't see that, why? And how can we get around this? Because it's not good for the overall ecosystem. So if Communitech all of a sudden starts calling their growth programs scale-up programs, which is what every other organization does, and growing is not the same as scaling, I say very strongly, 
If everybody talks about scaling when they're really just startup growth programs, how, do, how does the government differentiate to fund appropriately without destroying the ecosystem because of too much competition? Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Excellent answer. Yeah, I would say, and um, um, I like the entrepreneurial spirit of jumping on the on the bandwagon. I see that also everywhere. Also in the Netherlands, scale up is the new buzzword. And first of all, I find it a little bit unfair to start up because it um, it feels almost like uh, it's degrading start up, which is not at all the idea. Yeah, it's, that's also cool and fun. I think in uh, in the in the scale up world. Um, you, um, um, you, you play in a game where uh, professional services are possible. There is sufficient money, you've got folks that have put in series A or B, so they also want to see a return from it. So the, the, the requirement is, uh, is very, very different. And um, if you are um, um, uh, government sponsored, and, um, but you're supporting a company that has private money, private backing, and also has their own experience and background, you will have a short life. So I think um, you, you, you should just uh, invest in your own professional quality, um, make sure that you've got something to provide to the best of the best, that you can, t you can give insights that will make a VC listen, and then for the rest it's a temporary thing, but this will sort this out, itself out quickly. But with the startup community, because there is no business model, it, this kind of support level can continue till eternity. Because it will always be fell, fell back on public money. Yeah, but you will play in a competitive game, so quality will survive. Well, yeah? Last comments, yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right in, in the problem of having the same things popping up all over Canada. I think it's, it's a big problem that needs to change as soon as we can. So, last question to the audience. Are there people here who now, sorry, I think we had the last question, right? Yeah. So, are there, are there people here who now are more questioning of the value of startup incubators? If you are, raise your hands. Good. Are there people here who are more convinced of the value of startup incubators? Very few. So if this were a debate, uh, then we would have to award a prize to both of you because you both came down on the same answer. Thank you. <laughs> Which is great. Thank you very much for an enjoyable uh, 45 you. minutes. <laughs>